Hello, welcome back for Act 3 of Macbeth. He has killed the king. The king's sons have run off because they think they might be next on the hit list. And Macbeth is now king. So let's start Act 3. We are at the king's palace and Banquo enters the scene. He's talking to himself. Remember, um, characters in Shakespeare's plays, other plays too, do this. It's called a soliloquy. <clears throat> and they talk to themselves and it's mostly so we can hear what they're thinking. All right. He says, thou hast it now. King, Cawdor, Gloms, all, as the weird women promised. And I fear thou playedst most foully for it. Banquo thinks he knows who killed the king. Yet it was said it should not stand in thy posterity, but that myself should be the root and father of many kings. Those witches, those weird women, said you would be king, but didn't say your children would be king. Said my children will be kings. If there come truth from them, as upon thee, Macbeth, their speeches shine. Why, by the verities on thee made good, may they not be my oracles as well, and set me up in hope. They told you the truth. Maybe they told me the truth as well. But hush, no more. And enter Macbeth, Lady Macbeth, and all their attendants and lords. Macbeth greets Banquo. Here's our chief guest. Lady Macbeth says, If he had been forgotten, it had been as a gap at our great feast, an all thing unbecoming. He says, Tonight we hold a solemn supper, sir, and I'll request your presence. Banquo says, Let your highness command upon me, to the which my duties are with a most indissoluble tie forever knit. You're king now, Macbeth. You can order me to do whatever you want, but uh, you're my friend before. So, yes, I will come to your feast. Ride you this afternoon? I, my good lord. We should have else desired your good advice, which still hath been both grave and prosperous in this day's council. But we'll take tomorrow. Is it far you ride? As far, my lord, as will fill up the time twixt this and supper. Go not my horse the better, I must become a borrower of the night for the, a dark hour or twain. I'm going out for uh, kill time before dinner. Uh, if my horse doesn't go fast enough, I might the night might fall, but I think my horse will make it. Macbeth says, fail not our feast. My lord, I will not. We hear our bloody cousins are bestowed in England and in Ireland, not confessing their cruel parricide, filling their hearers with strange invention. But of that tomorrow, when therewithal we shall have cause of state craving us jointly. There are rumors coming from the parasides, Malcolm and Donald Bain, who did not kill their father. And they've got um, ideas. They've got hypotheses about what really happened. Hi, you to horse. Adieu, till you return at night. Goes Fleance with you? Fleance is Banquo's son. Aye, my good lord. Our time does call upon us. I wish your horses swift and sure of foot, and so I do commend you to their backs. Farewell. And he says to everyone, all his attendants, let every man be master of his time till seven at night. To make society the sweeter welcome, we will keep ourselves till supper time alone. Well then, God be with you. And everyone leaves but Macbeth and one attendant. And he says, Sirrah, a word with you. Attend those men at our pleasure. They are, my lord, without the palace gate. Bring them before us. So there's somebody waiting to talk to Macbeth. And they're about to come in. Macbeth says, To be thus is nothing, but to be safely thus. Being king, that's not enough. I need no danger that will take away the kingship from me. Our fears in Banquo stick deep, and in his royalty of nature reigns that which would be feared. Tis much he dares, and to that dauntless temper of his mind he hath a wisdom that doth guide his valor to act in safety. There is none but he whose being I do fear, and under him my genius is rebuked, as it is said Mark Antony's was by Caesar. He chid the sisters when first they put the name of king upon me, and bade them speak to him. 
Then prophet-like, they hailed him father to a line of kings. Upon my head, they placed a fruitless crown and put a barren scepter in my grip. Oh, they gave me the kingship, but they didn't give me a dynasty. What good does that do me? They put a barren scepter in my grip, thence to be wrenched with an unlineal hand. No son of mine succeeding. If it be so, for Banquo's issue have I filed my mind. For them, the gracious Duncan, have I murdered. Put rancors in the vessel of my peace only for them. And mine eternal jewel given to the common enemy of man to make them kings, the seed of Banquo kings. I have given, I've, I've committed atrocities for Banquo's family because I'm not going to have kids that are going to be king. And I have given my eternal jewel, my soul, to the common enemy of man, Satan, all for Banquo. <sighs> Rather than so, come fate into the list and champion me to the utterance. Who's there? The attendant comes in with two murderers. Now go to the door and stay there till we call. And he excuses the attendant. Was it not yesterday we spoke together? It was, so please your highness. Well then, now, have you considered of my speeches? Know you know that it was he in the times past which held you so under fortune, which you had thought had been our innocent self. This I made good to you in our last conference, passed in probation with you, how you were born in hand, how crossed the instruments who wrought with them, and all things else that might to half a soul and to a notion crazed say, thus did Banquo. Apparently these guys used to have something against Macbeth. They thought Macbeth was causing trouble for them. And Macbeth has convinced them, no, it was Banquo. Banquo was your true enemy. The murderer says, you made it known to us. I did so and went further, which is now our point of second meeting. Do you find your patience so predominant in your nature that you can let this go? Are you so gospeled to pray for this good man and for his issue, whose heavy hand hath bowed you to the grave and beggared yours forever? We are men, my liege. Aye, in the catalog you go for men, as hounds and greyhounds, mongrels, spaniels, curs, shuffs, water rugs, and demi wolves are clept all by the name of dogs. The valued file distinguishes the swift, the slow, the subtle, the housekeeper, the hunter, every one according to the gift which bounteous nature hath in him closed, whereby he doth receive particular attention from the bill that writes them all alike, and so of men. You know, you can study dogs, and, and there's all sorts of kinds of dogs, and they're all called dogs, but somebody who is really discerning about their dogs knows which ones are the better sort for which activities. And he said, this is also true of men. He said, he said we're men, my liege. Well, uh, yeah, technically, but what kind of men? Now, if you have a station in the file, not in the worst rank of manhood, say it, and I will put that business in your bosoms whose execution takes your enemy off, grapples you to the heart and love of us, who wear out health but sickly in his life, which in his death were perfect. Uh, you want to really be men? Uh, I've got a job for you. Get rid of Banquo. I am one, my liege, whom the vile blows and buffets of the world have so incensed that I am reckless what I do to spite the world. And the other murderer says, and I another, so weary with disasters, tugged with fortune, that I would set my life on any chance to mend it or be rid of it. Both of you know Banquo was your enemy. True, my lord. So is he mine, and in such bloody distance that every minute of his being thrusts against my nearest of life. And though I could with barefaced power sweep him from my sight and bid my will avouch it, yet I must not, for certain friends that are both his and mine, whose loves I may not drop, but wail his fall, who I myself struck down. And thence it is that I make, that I to your assistance do make love, masking the business from the common eye for sundry weighty reasons. You know, I am king now. I could just announce, I want Banquo executed. Then I could do it, but <clears throat> that might give me a bad reputation, so I need this to be done on the, on the down low. We shall, my lord, perform what you command us. Though our lives, and Macbeth interrupts them, your spirits shine through you. 
Within this hour at most, I will advise you where to plant yourselves, acquaint you with the perfect spy of the time, the moment on it, for it must be done tonight. And something from the palace always thought that I require a clearness. And with him, to leave no rubs nor botches in the work, Fleance, his son, that keeps him company, whose absence is no less material to me than is his father's, must embrace the fate of that dark hour. You gotta kill Fleance too. Resolve yourselves apart. I'll come to you anon. We are resolved, my lord. I'll call upon you straight. Abide within. And he dismisses them. It is concluded. Banquo, thy soul's flight, if it find heaven, must find it out tonight. Right. Scene two, we're still at the palace. And Lady Macbeth um, enters with a servant. And she says to him, Is Banquo gone from court? I, madam, but returns again tonight. Say to the king I would attend his leisure for a few words. Madam, I will. He leaves to go get Macbeth. And she says, Nought's had, all spent, where our desire is got without content. Tis safer to the, be that which we destroy than by destruction dwell in doubtful joy. Lady Macbeth is also not happy with things, but in a different way. She sees Macbeth is, is disturbed, that they're not enjoying their reign peacefully like she thought they were going to do when they killed the king. It was going to be so easy. Macbeth comes in and she says, How now, my lord? Why do you keep alone of sorriest fancies your companions making, using those thoughts which should indeed have died with them they think on? Things without all remedy should be without regard. What's done is done. You know, Macbeth, I think you just keep wandering away by yourself, and I think you're mulling over uh, and, and lamenting the fact that we killed the king. And it's done. Things without remedy should be without regard. You can't fix it. So you might as well just ignore it. What's done is done. She's mistaken in Macbeth, because Macbeth has not been brooding over the fact that he killed the king. He's been brooding over the fact that he killed the king, but he's not going to have children who are king because Banquo and Fleance live. He answers her, We have scotched the snake, not killed it. She'll close and be herself, whilst our poor malice remains in danger of her former tooth. You know, this situation of ours, it's like a snake. It's like a venomous snake. And we've, we've wounded it, but we haven't killed it. There are still events that might happen and things that might happen that will foil our happiness and we need to get them all out of the way. But let the frame of things disjoint, both the worlds suffer, ere we will eat our meal in fear and sleep in the affliction of these terrible dreams that shake us nightly. Better be with the dead, whom we to gain our peace have sent to peace, than on the torture of the mind to lie in restless ecstasy. Duncan is in his grave. After life's fitful fever, he sleeps well. Treason has done his worst. Nor steel, nor poison, malice, domestic, foreign levy, nothing can touch him further. Lady Macbeth says, come on, gentle, my lord, sleek o'er your rugged looks. Be bright and jovial among your guests tonight. So shall I, love, so I pray, and so I pray be you. Let your remembrance apply to Banquo. Present him eminence, both with eye and tongue. Unsafe the while, that we must lave our honors in these flattering streams, and make our faces vizards to our hearts, disguising what they are. She says, you must leave this. Oh, full of scorpions is my mind, dear wife. Thou knowest that Banquo and his fleance lives. But in them nature, nature's copies not etern. They're not, they're not immortal. There's comfort yet. They are assailable. Then be thou, thou jocund, ere the bat hath flown his cloistered flight, ere to black Hecate summons the shard-born beetle with his drowsy hums hath rung night's yawning peal. There shall be done a deed of dreadful note. Before night comes, oh, something's going down. What's to be done? Be innocent of the knowledge, dearest Chuck, till thou applaud the deed. 
Come, sealing night, scarf up the tender eye of pitiful day, and with thy bloody and invisible hand, cancel and tear to pieces that great bond which keeps me pale. What bond keeps him pale? The existence of Banquo, the fact that Banquo's family is destined to be kings. Light thickens, and the crow makes wing to the rookie wood. Good things of day begin to droop and drowse, whilst night's black agents to their praise do rouse. He speaks to her, Thou marvelest at my words, but hold thee still. Things bad begun make strong themselves by ill. So prithee, go with me. Right. Now we go to a park near the palace where the murderers have been stationed to watch for Banquo. But there were two murderers before, and a third one has joined them. The other guys weren't expecting the third one. So he says, But who did bid thee join us? Macbeth. He needs not our mistrust, since he delivers our offices and what we have to do to the direction just. He doesn't need to mistrust us. Why does he, why does he send somebody to spy on us and make sure we do it right? We know exactly what to do. Then stand with us. The west yet glimmers with some streaks of day. Now spurs the lated traveler apace to gain the timely inn, and near approaches the subject of our watch. Hark, I hear horses. And you hear Banquo in the distance say, Give us a light there, ho! Then tis he. The rest that are within the note of expectation are already in the count. E everybody else is already come to the banquet. Everybody else on the guest list. His horses go about. Almost a mile, but he does usually, so all men do, from hence to the palace gate, make it their walk. A light, a light! Banquo and Fleance come in with a torch. Tis he! Stand to it. Banquo says, it will rain tonight. And the first murderer jumps out and says, let it come down. And they set upon Banquo. He cries out to his son, O oh, treachery, fly, good fleance, fly, fly, fly. Thou mayest revenge, O oh, slave. And he dies and fleance gets away. The third murderer says, who did strike out the light? Was not the way? There's but one down. The sun is fled. We have lost the best half of our affair. Well, let's away and say how much is done. Let's just go report to Macbeth. We got one of them. We'll get the other one eventually. Okay, now the scene shifts back to the palace. And remember, they're having a banquet. They're having a big uh, feast tonight. And Banquo has been invited. Of course, Macbeth knows Banquo's never coming or hopes he's never coming. But everyone else is there. And they all come in. Macbeth says, you know your own degrees. Sit down. At first and last, the hearty welcome. And the lords all say, thanks to your majesty. Our self will mingle with society and play the humble host. Our hostess keeps her state, but in best time we'll, we will require her welcome. Lady Macbeth says, pronounce it for me, sir, to all our friends, for my heart speaks they are welcome. This has all been a big to-do to say to everyone, you are welcome. To our feast and they say thank you but the murderer comes to the door and Macbeth says see they encounter thee with their hearts thanks he's still talking to Lady Macbeth both sides are even here I'll sit in the midst be large in mirth anon we'll drink a measure of the table round then he goes over to the door to talk to the murderer there's blood upon blood upon thy face tis Banquo's then "'Tis better thee without than he within. "'Is he dispatched? "'My lord, his throat is cut. "'That I did for him. "'Thou art the best of the cutthroats. "'Yet he's good that did the like for Fleance. "'If thou didst it, thou art the non pareil. <sighs> "'Most royal, sir, Fleance escaped. "'Then comes my fit again. "'I had else been perfect, whole as the marble, "'founded as the rock, "'as broad and general as the casing air. But now I am cabined, cribbed, confined, bound into saucy doubts and fears. But Banquo safe? Ah, my good lord, safe in a ditch he bides with twenty trenchant gashes on his head, the least a death to nature. Thanks for that. There's the grown ser there the grown serpent lies. The worm that's fled hath nature that in time will venom breed. Okay, so the, the parent snake is dead but the baby snake has gotten away and he'll grow 
and he'll cause problems. I lost my place just a second. Okay. Um, he has no teeth for the present. Get thee gone. Tomorrow we will hear ourselves again. And the murderer leaves. Lady Macbeth says, My royal lord, you do not give the cheer. The feast is sold that is not often vouched. While tis a making, tis given with welcome. To feed were best at home. From thence the sauce to meet is ceremony. Meeting were bare without it. You know, we're having a feast. The only reason to have a feast is for socialization and company. And you're off in a corner talking to some guy. Come be a host. He says, sweet remembrancer. Now, good digestion, weight on appetite, and health on both. Lennox says, may it please your highness, sit. But unseen by everyone else, the ghost of Banquo comes in and sits in Macbeth's chair. <sighs> Macbeth doesn't see it yet, but he says, here had we now our country, country's honor roofed were the graced person of our Banquo present. Who may I rather challenge for unkindness than pity for mischance? I wonder what happened to Banquo. I hope nothing bad happened to Banquo. His absence, sir, lays blame upon his promise. Pleased your highness to grace us with your royal company. And Macbeth looks around and says, there's no empty chair. The table's full. Here's a place reserved, sir. Where? Here, my good lord. What is it that moves your highness? He sees who's sitting in the chair and he says, which of you have done this? What, my good lord? Thou canst not say I did it. Never shake thy gory locks at me. Gentlemen, rise. His highness is not well. Lady Macbeth says, sit, worthy friends. My, my lord is often thus and hath been from his youth. Pray you keep seat. The fit is momentary. Upon a thought he will again be well. If much you note him, you shall offend him and extend his passion. Feed and regard him not. Oh, you know, the king, the guy you just made king, has some sort of mental aberration that causes him to have hallucinations and fits. Well, that's nice to know. She says to him, Are you a man? Aye, and a bold one that dare look on that which might appall the devil. She says, oh, proper stuff. This is the very painting of your fear. This is the air-drawn dagger which you said led you to Duncan. Oh, these flaws and starts, impostors to true fear, would well become a woman's story at a winter's fire, authorized by her granddam. Shame itself. Why do you make such faces? When all's done, you look but on a stool. There's nothing there. He says, prithee, see there, behold. Look, lo, how say you? Why, what care I, if thou canst nod, speak too? If charnel houses and our graves must send those that we bury back, our monuments shall be the maws of kites. She says, oh, what, quite unmanned in folly. If I stand here, I saw him. Fie for shame. Blood hath been shed ere now in the olden time, ere human statute purged the gentle wheel. I and since two murders have been performed too terrible for the ear. The time has been that when the brains were out, the man would die and there an end. But now they rise again with 20 mortal murders on their crowns and push us from our stools. This is more strange than such a murder is. My worthy Lord, your noble friends do lack you. Would you get a grip and go back to the feast? I do forget. Do not muse at me, my most worthy friends. I have a strange infirmity, which is nothing to those that know me. Come, love and health to all. Then I'll sit down. Give me some wine. Fill full. I drink to the general joy of the whole table, and to our dear friend Banquo, whom we miss. Would he were here. To all and him we thirst, and all to all. They say our duties and the pledge. But there's the ghost again. Avaunt, and quit my sight. Let the earth hide thee. Thy bones are marrowless. Thy blood is cold. Thou hast no speculation in those eyes which thou dost glare with. His wife says, Think of this, good peers, but is nothing of custom. Tis no other, only it spoils the pleasure of the time. He, he just, he does this. He's doing it again. Just, he's having one of his fits. It's okay. Macbeth says, What man dare, I dare. 
approach thou like the rugged Russian bear, the armed rhinoceros, or the hyrcan tiger? <clears throat> Take any shape but that, and my firm nerve shall never tremble, or be alive again, and dare me to the desert with thy sword. If trembling I inhabit, then protest me the baby of a girl. Hence, horrible shadow, unreal mockery, hence. And it leaves. <sighs> Why so? Being gone, I am a man again. Pray you, sit still. She says, you have displaced the mirth, broke the good meeting with most admired disorder. You ruin the party. Can such things be and overcome us like a summer's cloud without our special wonder? You make me strange even to the disposition that I owe, when now I think you can behold such sights and keep the natural ruby of your cheeks when mine is blanched with fear. He, he says to his wife, how can you look at that and, and not turn pale and not look horrified? But of course, no one else saw anything. Ross says, what sights, my lord? Lady Macbeth says, I pray you speak not. He grows worse and worse. Question enrages him. At once, good night. Stand not upon the order of your going, but go at once. Good night, and better health attend his majesty. A kind good night to all. They all leave, but Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. And Macbeth says, It will have blood. They say blood will have blood. Stones have been known to move and trees to speak. Augurs and understood relations have by maggot pies and chuffs and rooks brought forth the secretest man of blood. What is the night? Almost at odds with morning, which is which? So he feels like the world, nature, is coming against him to remind him of what he has done. She says, it's almost at odds with morning, which is which. How sayest thou that Macduff denies his person at our great bidding? Did you send to him, sir? I hear it, by the way, but I will send. There's not a one of them, but in his house I keep a servant feed. He invited Macduff to, uh, to this feast, and Macduff just stiffed him. He didn't come. And Macbeth has just given out a piece of information here. I'll find out what's going there because there's not a one of them, but in his house I keep a servant feed. I'm paying spies in the household of all the different lords of the kingdom. <clears throat> I will tomorrow, and betimes I will, to the weird sisters. More shall they speak, for now I am bent to know by the worst means the worst. For mine own good all causes shall give way. I am in blood stepped in so far, that should I wade no more, returning were as tedious as go o'er. Strange things I have in head that will to hand, which must be acted ere they may be scanned. I have, it's like I'm walking through a river of blood, and I've walked in so far that I might as well keep walking, because it's just as much trouble to try to go back now. I'm going to go find those weird sisters again, those women, and I want more information. And he says, I've got some plans. And he says, which must be acted ere they may be scanned. I'm going to do it before I think about it. The first thing that I think of, if I think I need to do something that will bring me security, I'm just going to do it and not think too much about it. Lady Macbeth says, you lack the season of all natures. Sleep. He doesn't sleep. Remember the night he killed Duncan? He said he thought he heard a voice saying, Macbeth doth murder sleep. Sleep no more. He can't sleep. But he says to her, come, will to sleep. My strange and self-abuse is the initiate fear that once hard use, we are yet but young indeed. My mental distress is simply the initiate fear, the fear a beginner has. A beginner in what? Murder. We are yet but young indeed, but we're going to get better and better at it. Okay, so as he said he was going to, he, he goes out, 
um, uh, he's going to go out to the to the heath where the witches are. But in the meantime, the scene shifts and we see them there. The first witch says, "Why, how now, Hecate? You look angrily." Hecate is a is actually a Greek goddess, but it's sort of the the goddess of witchcraft. She says, "Have I not reason, beldams as you are, saucy and overbold?" How did you dare to trade and traffic with Macbeth in riddles and affairs of death? And I, the mistress of your charms, the close contriver of all harms, was never called to bear my part or show the glory of our art. And which is worse, all you have done hath been but for a wayward son, spiteful and wrathful, who as others do, loves for his own ends, not for you. But make amends now, get you gone, and at the pit of Acheron meet me in the morning, thither he will come to know his destiny. Your vessels and your spells provide, your charms and everything beside. I am for the air, this night I'll spend unto a dismal and a fatal end. Great business must be wrought ere noon, upon the corner of the moon. There hangs a vaporous drop profound, I'll catch it ere it come to ground. And that distilled by magic slight shall raise such artificial sprites, as by the strength of their illusion shall draw him on to his confusion. He shall spurn fate, scorn death, and bear his hopes above wisdom, grace, and fear. And you all know security is mortal's chiefest enemy. And then they, they go away singing a song. Hark, I am called, my little spirit, see, sits in a foggy cloud and stays for me. Come, let's make haste. She'll soon be back again. Hecate says, why didn't you let me in on this? Well, we're going we're gonna to put quite a show together for Macbeth. He's going to come and find out his destiny, and I'm going to conjure up sprites that are going to make him feel so secure. And she says, um, you all know security is mortal's chiefest enemy. All right, back to the palace. Lennox and another lord. Lennox says, my former speeches have but hit your thoughts which can interpret farther. Only, I say, things have been strangely born. All right, Lennox and many of the other lords are starting to become suspicious of Macbeth. There's something fishy going on here. The gracious Duncan was pitied of Macbeth. Mary, he was dead, and the right valiant Banquo walked too late, whom you may say, if you please, Fleance killed for fleance fled. Men must not walk too late. Who cannot want the thought how monstrous it was for Malcolm and for Donalbane to kill their gracious father? Damned fact! How it did grieve Macbeth! Did he not straight in pious rage the two delinquents tear that were the slaves of drink and thralls of sleep? Was not that nobly done? Aye, and wisely, too, for twould have angered any heart alive to hear the men deny it so that, I say, he has borne all things well. And I do think that, had he Duncan's sons under his key, as, and it please heaven, he shall not, they should find what twere to kill a father. So should Fleance. But peace, for from broad words, and cause he failed his presence at the tyrant's feast, I hear Macduff lives in disgrace. Sir, can you tell where he bestows himself? Okay, so Lennox is being... Uh, satirical, ironical here. Um, oh, you know, it's it, it's a bad idea apparently to go out too late. And aren't we having a a spurt of sons killing their fathers? First it was Malcolm and Donalbane, and now it's Fleance. Hmm. I wonder. And you know, Macbeth really seemed genuinely upset about all of these things, but I don't know because as he closes his talk here, Lennox refers to Macbeth as the tyrant. And he said that Macduff has, um, lives in disgrace because he failed his presence at the tyrant's feast. And then he asked this other lord, do you know, do you know where he is, where Macduff is? <sighs> the son of Duncan, from whom this tyrant holds the due of birth, lives in the English court and is received of the most pious Edward with such grace that the malevolence of fortune nothing takes from his high respect. Thither Macduff is gone to pray the holy king upon his aid to wake Northumberland and warlike Seward, that by the help of these, with him above to ratify the work, 
we may again give to our tables meat, sleep to our nights, free from our feasts and blank banquets bloody knives, do faithful homage and receive free honors, all which we pine for now. And this report hath so exasperate the king that he prepares for some attempt of war. Okay, so Malcolm is holed up with King Edward, King of England, and uh, he's asking for troops and help to come back, march on Scotland, and take back what is his own. And Macduff has gone to confer with him. Lennox says, sent he to Macduff? He did. And with an absolute, sir, not I, the cloudy messenger turns me his back and hums as who should say, you'll rue, rue the time that clogs me with this answer. And that well might advise him to a caution to hold what distance his wisdom can provide. Some holy angel fly to the court of England and unfold his message ere he come that a swift blessing may soon return to this our suffering country under a hand accursed. I'll send my prayers with him. All right. So we end this act three with only hope for Scotland being Malcolm coming back to take revenge on the killer of his father and to take back what's his own. In the meantime, Macbeth is just on a rip roar and rampage. He has killed Duncan, he has killed the two guards who were supposed to be framed for that murder. He has killed Banquo. He's tried to kill Fleance. And now Macduff is in his bad graces because Macduff gave the brush off to his feast. Where will Macbeth stop? We'll find out in Act 4. See you next time.